Emily Swigart, who did so much work bringing this index to fruition again this year. Let's talk briefly about the index, um, just as a reminder that rather than measuring perceived levels of corruption as other studies do, what the CCC index does is it evaluates and ranks 15 Latin American countries based on their ability to detect, punish, and prevent corruption. The goal is not to shame or single out countries, but to foster a policy-driven conversation, uh, helping government, civil society, and the private sector identify through data and a robust methodology um, the areas of success and deficiencies to be addressed. And to this year's main conclusions, uh, if you have a look at um, this year's scores, the big takeaway is that 2023 was a year of setbacks uh, for anti-corruption efforts, and almost no one was immune. Um, the index confirmed what many of us already sensed, uh, that fighting corruption is no longer as big a priority in some countries as it was five or even three years ago. Uh, among the 15 countries that we study as part of the index, 10 of them saw declines in their scores. Uh, the setbacks were seen among countries uh, really just across the board, um, countries that did relatively well in the index, such as uh, Uruguay, Chile, and Costa Rica, as well as those that scored at the bottom, including Guatemala and Venezuela. So the, the next question is why? Well, Garrett will get into some of the country-specific reasons in just a moment, but looking at the region as a whole, it's no secret that democracies are under pressure uh, in several countries throughout Latin America. We know that the, you know, the, fight, the, the, the key to fighting corruption, uh, it's not a secret, it has to do with independent judicial institutions uh, and other institutions within a democracy. And in many cases, those are facing pressure from leaders who are trying to concentrate power. Uh, another trend in 2023 is uh, we saw that the scores measuring performance for civil society and media uh, was an area that saw some, some significant declines. In some countries, this is a story of governments that are taking aim at journalists uh, and members of civil society. And frankly, in other countries, it's a story of competing priorities, um, issues like organized crime and democratic backsliding, which have become areas of greater concern. Uh, the post-pandemic recovery in a lot of countries as well. Uh, because at the end of the day, civil society uh, and media um, only have so much bandwidth. And when these other issues get attention, budget, uh, and coverage, that means in practice, in some cases, that corruption is less likely to be um, detected and punished. It does merit saying though, just on the positive side of the ledger, it would be a mistake to say that corruption has fallen off the public radar entirely. 70% um, of our respondents uh, to the internal survey that forms part of the methodology for this study, 70% of our respondents uh, said that corruption was still considered a major issue by the public in their countries. If you look at polling, um, as I probably spend too much of my day doing, uh, in individual countries, corruption in some cases is very near the top of the list of public concerns, if not at the top. And finally, as we look at this year's scores, uh, while it's true that we saw backsliding uh, and that 10 of the 15 countries were down, really in most countries, it was more of a slow erosion than an abrupt decline which means that there's still plenty of opportunity for these setbacks to be reversed. So with that overview, I'd like to hand things over to my good friend and partner uh, every year as we put this index together now, five years running, Geert Albers of Control Risks. Geert, over to you. Thank you very much, Brian. And uh, again, thank you, Brian, uh, Emily. And Brian mentioned um, you know, the index measures uh, the capacity these 15 countries have to actually do something about the problem of corruption, not the level of corruption itself. And that's obviously an important distinction, but one we like to remind people of at the outset. On the methodology front, I won't get too geeky on you. I think it's important just to outline uh, you know, at a high level what we do. So essentially the index measures three key categories, which we think are fundamental pillars to uh, you know, effectively being able to combat corruption legal capacity or rule of law, 
uh, you know, important things such as, you know, the independence of the judiciary and, and other institutions uh, or levels of international cooperation, which are very important for anti-corruption enforcement. The second one, democracy and political institutions. And the third one, civil society and media. Um, and particularly, you know, the freedom investigative journalists have to actually report on corruption uh, issues. The three categories are subsequently subdivided in 14 variables. Um, I'll spare you the details of those, but uh, suffice to say that the scoring of those variables is based on two main sources. One is publicly available data from renowned institutions, and the other one is proprietary uh, structured surveys, responses to those uh, to experts in each one of the countries, um, and they uh, are then subsequently scored. That's in terms of key findings, um, some of you may have seen already the leading article in America's Quarterly, which is published this morning. Um, and it essentially summarizes the situation as a tough year. And that's really what we've seen. And if you just look at this year compared to last year, you probably won't notice a tremendous amount of difference because the top five ranked countries are the same as, the, um, as last year and the bottom five ranked countries are also the same as last year. However, whereas last year, we had, uh, you know, what Brian mentioned, a certain degree of erosion, uh, nothing too dramatic, but we did see, as uh, you know, Brian also mentioned, 10 of the 15 controlled decline in the average of the scores of all the countries since 2020. Um, and we saw that the top three countries ranked and the bottom um, are suffering or at least uh, facing a fair degree of challenge. Now, Uruguay was once again the top performer, followed by Costa Rica and Chile. That is a repeat from last year. Guatemala, Bolivia, and Venezuela, same as last year, is a repeat from last year, actually, and the year before. The country which we saw the most improvement, we will dive into that in a little bit more detail, is Panama. And this uh, country, along with um, Dominican Republic and Paraguay, have actually been on up and Mexico. Um, and we will look into those in more detail because uh, it's important to understand what's going on into those given the influence they have over the region. We see that Brazil had a slight uptick, whereas Mexico continued on its multi-year down year slide. Uh, we will contextualize that uptick um, because obviously the, the questions out there whether you know Brazil has turned a corner or not. And just one final comment uh, before I hand over to Mario, our Brazil analyst or Brazil analyst from Control Risks. Um, we, you know, when we do this exercise here, we're actually less concerned about rankings than we are, you know, ranked fifth and sixth. What separates them is about 0 0.2 points, which is very, very immaterial. However, this really, uh, I, I think the, the important point that will then Peru. So um, our ask of everyone uh, in the audience and uh, all other users of the index is not to get too fixated on the rankings themselves, really, um, you know, make a, try and make a comparative analysis with previous years. And on that note, over to you, Mario, to provide us some details into what's happening in Brazil. Thank you very much, Yurt, and thanks everyone for joining, for taking the time to discuss the CCC. Basically, uh, as you said, we're looking at the movie here rather than the snapshot. So what the combination of the results throughout these past years tell us, rather than uh, 2023 alone. And with that in mind, uh, basically what we can say is that Brazil, uh, its capacity to combat corruption has stagnated after uh, a three-year decline. Uh, the percentual point improvement uh, of just 1.5% is basically a negligible and still very early to say that Brazil has a material improvements in anti-corruption efforts in coming years. So. What we see now is basically a flat line uh, when compared to uh, last year. So uh, to understand this uh, evolution, it's important to take a step back and see and think how in 20, uh, 2019, uh, analyze the countries throughout these years, how corruption was much more uh, an important topic, was much more on the center stage of the public debate in Brazil. And we think that there are two main factors that help to explain the decline we have seen over the past years. One of them uh, has to do with something that Brian has already mentioned, and it's also occurring in other countries, but as the fact that other topics have gained more uh, importance and have become more prominent in the public debates. So we can think just uh, as a few ones, if you think about 2020, uh, cash transfer, provide uh, healthcare support, uh, public policy overall uh, regarding healthcare. Uh, in 2022, we had external shocks resulting uh, in inflationary pressure. 
we've had the, the socioeconomic malaise affecting millions of people in the country as well. And especially in the second half of last year, uh, there were growing concerns about the country's uh, the anti-corruption efforts, not only in Brazil, but elsewhere. But here you have, for example, the media, NGOs, civil society, so to speak, focusing on the importance of uh, respecting the election results, for instance, and uh, preventing democratic rupture. And in that, against that, as a result, uh, the scrutiny uh, has not been as intense as it was in previous years. Now that said, we need that's especially the case at the federal level, when we're talking about the federal government, uh, from different uh, political parties, from actors from different sides of the political spectrum, but we continue to see stories uncovering uh, potential wrongdoings and eventually leading to investigations. Uh, but we need to keep in mind, and that's something that has not really changed, but when we look at, especially at the local level, the municipal level, the resources for, for media, for investigative journalism are rather scarce, and that will continue to be we need to take into account when we look at Brazil's broader uh, trend in the CCC uh, is basically the growing attempts we saw over the past year agencies. We noticed the appointments of uh, perceived loyalists to key institutions. We're talking about the federal police, uh, the revenue services, the prosecutor general's office, for example. And, and these are critical because these are institutions that enable the country to detect, to punish, and to prevent corruption, which is basically what the CCC index is aimed at a measuring. So these drivers, these actions, uh, they undermine the country's ability and they help explain this uh, declining trend. What we saw in early 2023 is that these agencies have at least partially regained their autonomy. We cannot say that they have become fully independent, uh, but at least this declining trend of their past years has uh, not continued. And that is important and that helps explain also the stagnation uh, that we see in the overall score in years. Uh, also important to have in mind, while this is a mar marginal improvement when compared to uh, 2022, there are other aspects that indicate uh, a potential undermining of the anti-corruption uh, efforts and also um, that basically offset uh, improvements in some other areas. And these are, for example, the changes in legislation to make political appointments to state-owned prosecutor general from the short list provided by public prosecutors themselves, which helps to uh, build the case that the full autonomy of these agencies will not be regained. There, there may be uh, some degree of political influence, and it's something that we need to pay attention to uh, in the next year to, to see how Brazil progresses. And just to wrap, perhaps, a focus on Brazil's Achilles heel, uh, that basically is the variable that had the largest uh, setback among the 14 we measure and its relationships between uh, the executive and the legislative branches, uh, how pork barreling continues to dominate uh, these exchanges. And why we had the secret budget in recent years being something that was uh, something that uh, mechanisms to release funds to, to legislators in exchange of political support. So that's something that has not changed and is beyond political parties and will basically continue to undermine uh, the anti-corruption efforts. With that, I hand over to Lucia Lopez, who will cover uh, the results for Mexico. Lucia. Thank you very much, Mario. Um, so this year, Mexico registered a 4% decline in the CCC index overall score, continuing a downward trend for a fourth consecutive year and remaining in 12th place. And this is only above countries like Guatemala, Bolivia and Venezuela. And although it is not a very pronounced drop, it is still concerning, given that uh, as Gert mentioned, and as most of you would know, Mexico is the second largest economy in Latin America. And a, its president, Andrés Manuel López Obrador, or, or no, known as AMLO, has made tackling corruption a central priority of his government since he took office over four years ago. So given these years and the, previ the, the previous three years results in the index, we can see that this anti-corruption fight remains only in rhetoric. Now, 
Turning to the categories covered by the index, we saw the most pronounced downgrade in the civil society and the media category with a 10% drop. There's, there are various factors around this drop, and I would like to cover uh, very briefly two of them. So the first one is the very adverse conditions faced by journalists in Mexico. First, uh, it is known that Mexico uh, is among the most violent countries in the world only after Ukraine to exercise this profession. And also new allegations have emerged in the use of the Pegasus spyware uh, against journalists, activists and members of the civil society that are contributing in the fight, fight against corruption. And um, for many of you that follow Andres Manuel López Obrador singling out journalists that criticize his government, or journalists that conduct investigative work that involve his family, involves his family or his allies. So it is not um, it, it is not a, a bright environment for journalists in the country in general. A large scale protest, specifically specifically targeting anti corruption efforts made by the government, um, and we think that this is because AMLO is monopolizing the anti corruption discourse by continuously mentioning in all types of, um, of publications and also during his mañaneras that his government is not corrupt and that he himself is not corrupt. So somehow uh, he has given to the public the, the perception that it, it, there is various actions being done against corruption, but actually, as we will see, this remains in rhetoric. Now, turning to the legal cap recorded a 14% setback in the variable assessing anti-corruption agencies, independence and efficiency. So in general, uh, as, as we mentioned, it is a continuous trend. AMLO continues to criticize independent, uh, independent agencies and has ramped up efforts to centralize power. To, centralize, uh, to illustrate this, I would like to cover two developments that I found in the protection of personal data, a very long name for an institution, but it's a transparency uh, institute. And AMLO recently vetoed the commissioners appointed by the Senate. And this has basically um, blocked the ENI from cons considered sabotage against institutional transparency. Um, as many of you would remember, many of the large corruption, case that, the corruption cases that have been investigated and uncovered um, have, um, have used information that's, that has been provided through INAI's interventions. So INAI is one of the main tools enabled to operate and transparency requests are basically piling up at the hundreds or thousands. Um, the second development that I would like to mention uh, in regard to anti-corruption agencies is the um, uh, a risk the authority and power to concentrate the uh, concentrate the, uh, the planning, the conduction, and the surveillance of the of government procurement and spending. So, in in other words, the Ministry of Public Administration will be a judge in its own cause because we'll be able to conduct the procurement activities, but at the same time, we'll... now I would like to turn to um, to critical developments that I think uh, are worth monitoring. The corruption, uh, sorry, the anti-corruption institution under the national anti-corruption system saw an 86% budget mechanism, and um, very recently has introduced an initiative to eliminate its executive secretariat, which is, this secretariat is basically the civil society coordination element of the national anti-corruption system, and AMLO not concentrating, further concentrating power in the executive power. If this is approved, this would definitely jeopardize the independence. It's a Segalmex corruption case, many of you would probably have heard of. Um, and this involves the Mexican around $15 billion. And it's the largest corruption case that has been uncovered during AMLO administration. And the misappropriation uh, took place between 2019 and 2021. Um, it most, must be noted that although some, pro some progress has been made, very the case remains highly politicized and some actors, uh, mainly one of the related to AMLO's son, 
uh, which means that the uh, and these actors have not seen um, uh, prosecution or in many cases remain completely off the hook, which means that cases like Segalmex uh, that are very uh, covered by AMLO in the Mañaneras and that are showcased as if the government is uh, really tackling co corruption uh, continue to be politicized. Now to wrap up, I would like just to end uh, with a um, an outlook note. Um, we, it, must, it, it is important to note that Mexico will have presidential elections uh, in 2024, not only presidential, but also legislative and gubernatorial. And this, of course, will open up the opportunity for corruption during a critical time where we to see corruption featuring prominently in all the campaigns. And uh, we, of course, expect to see very key uh, findings. I will now turn it to Sebastián to cover the Panama findings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. And, and Sebastian, before you kick off there on Panama, uh, let me please just remind uh, all of you in the audience, at least those who have uh, dialed in or connected via Zoom, uh, you can feel free to uh, send questions in the queue. Did we, did we lose? Sebastian? It appears so. Yeah, it looks like we may have. Well, while we wait for him to reconnect, oh, there he's back. Um, I do have a question for Mario if, but Sebastian, if you're back, uh, take it away. Yeah, sorry, I had a small Wi Fi issue. But um, so I was saying Panama has grown in the past three years. We have seen growth, a positive development in their score since the Panama Papers scandal and their inclusion in the Financial Action Task Force Grey List for Enhanced Monitoring and also in the European Union's list of non-cooperative non jurisdictions for tax purposes. So Panama has shown positive developments in the past in the past three years they have this year. Some variables that have shown uh, variation, especially, especially in the legal capacity, are the are the non-cooperative the anti-corruption organisms, the effectiveness of anti-corruption mechanisms, and the increasing effectiveness of the Attorney General's office. This has been shown in multiple investigations in the past few years, in the past few years, especially against high against, against high profile political high profile political figures in Panama. Especially in the last few months, we had a case against the former president Ricardo Martinelli for misappropriation of public funds, the new business case, and we are expecting uh, a sentencing or uh, charges by the center of the Panama paper scandal in connection with the Lava Hato case in Brazil. There, there is also, in August, we also have the beginning of the Odebrecht investigation against former president, also involving former president Martinelli and former president Juan Carlos Varela for accepting bribes in public office. So that's where Panama has seen the majority of its growth in the past, in the past few years. And that's why Panama continues to the Panama score continues to increase in the CCC index. There are certain other, one of the other things that I want to mention is where Panama has failed in the past few years and where there is a chance of growth is the failure to practically to implement their finance, their action plan agreed with the Financial Action Task Force in 2021. The recent, the recent plenary by the FATF on June 23 showed that Panama has made some progress in implementing in implementing reforms to its anti money laundering scheme and its combating of financial of financing terrorism scheme, but has not made the the most significant improvements that would allow them to be removed from the gray list. The FATF has agreed an inside visit for the second half of this year, which is a positive development in this scenario. And the Panamanian authorities are hoping to be removed from the list in October 2023. However, this seems a really, a really optimistic time frame given the complexity of the reforms that they have to implement, including creating a registry of, fin of final beneficiaries in the transactions that, are, that happen through their financial system, meaning that the companies that are trying to use the Panamanian system to avoid paying taxes in other jurisdictions are, would be unable to do so. This requires a complex reform, and this and this 
at least that would take at least a year to implement. So the October 2023 timeframe remains a little bit optimistic for the removal from the grid list. However, these are positive developments in their implementation of the of the action plan agreed in 2021. Secondly, I also want to point out we Panama experienced last year, at the mid last year, massive protests, which also had a corruption of the political class that have been that have been but that have been not as comprehensive as expected. However, this could be a positive development in the coming years as it could help develop a more conscious, a more conscious civil society sector in Panama, which is something they, they have lacked in the past few years, a more this conscious civil society sector that focuses more on anti-corruption in the in the coming years. And finally, one of the one of those last things I wanted to mention is Panama also has elections for next year, general elections, presidential and legislative elections. Currently, former President Martinelli is, has a comfortable lead in poll. He's running 40, 40 points of the second candidate. This creates concern, especially in regards to anti-corruption, from somebody who has significant corruption allegations. However, if President Martinelli is sentenced in this trial or the one beginning in August in relation to, to bribes at the time of his presidency, he would be barred from running and they would blow the race wide open. However, should he win, it would create concerns, especially in the relations between Panama and the United States, given that Martinelli is barred from traveling to the United States due to corruption. And this is some, and the United States has been increasingly supportive of Panama's anti-corruption efforts and their increasing oversight of their financial sector. So that's one of the key things that 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 happens in the next in the next year in Panama, and that would affect their anti their anti-corruption environment and it will create opportunities, but also obstacles to increase their scoring the CCC index. So, and with that, I take it back to Brian and Gert for the Q&A. All right, thank you very much, Sebastian. Well, we have about 10 minutes left, so let's take some audience questions. The first one is for Mario, it's about Brazil. And the question is that the Brazil's lei anti-corrupção, their, their anti-corruption law, uh, has now been in place for 10 years now. Uh, could you give us a brief comment on its effectiveness over time? Sure, Brian. Uh, this was indeed an important uh, step in Brazil's anti-corruption efforts as uh, it, all, it also paved the way for our other developments over the past decade. Basically, just to summarize very briefly, uh, it allows the civil and administrative responsabilization of companies that are involved in corruption uh, acts. Uh, and it also, for example, enabled the imposition of higher fines that go up to 20% of gross revenues. Uh, and in addition to this uh, kind of increased power to sanction uh, corruption uh, actors, uh, it also created instruments such as the leniency agreements and the responsabilization administrative process, the, the PAR, that help to further investigate and uncover uh, corruption uh, schemes. The other side of that, in terms of the effects it had on uh, the private sector, for example, is that we had uh, seen in Brazil over the past decade, the so-called uh, compliance boom. So in an environment in which companies can uh, be uh, scrutinized and can be brought into account, they are incentivized to adopt uh, higher uh, compliance, uh, internal compliance uh, practice. And that has also helped to increase the anti-corruption efforts from the private sector perspective. So indeed, indeed this has been like a, a watershed in terms of Brazil's anti-corruption efforts. All right, thank you very much. And Gerda, I know that you follow Brazil quite closely as well. Do you, do you have anything to anything to add on that point as we kind of take the, the long view of this Brazil anti-corruption story, which is, I think it's safe to say, had some ups and downs over the last 10 years? Yeah, I know it has had some ups and downs. And I, I think, you know, Matt's point, uh, the comments are absolutely on pre in history, um, the implementation of the law. Of course, what's happened in, in uh, you know, in the past years has been questioning about some of the tactics used um, and, you know, the way the law has been leaned on um, to actually form you know, the investigations that have been going on, unraveling quite spectacularly. 
Um, but I think an important element of all of this, uh, of course, the index doesn't focus on this, or at least it's not the main focus of the index. I think an important element of all of this is what this has done, um, you know, this anti crowding their own programs um, and making sure that they are also part of the ecosystem of promoting greater transparency in business behavior. So um, I'll just uh, leave it at that comment. Okay, very good. Uh, I'd like to bring in Lucia to um, really a couple of weeks to the election next year. Uh, as you pointed out, uh, corruption and anti-corruption fighting efforts have been a major priority of the Lopez Obrador government, although in practice, uh, the results have, have, have underwhelmed, let's say. Um, I mean, that's what the index is, is clearly telling us. This of anti-corruption efforts is it becoming a major campaign issue? Are there proposals coming from different parts, whether it's civil society? Thank you, Brian. And yes, definitely, as I mentioned, corruption will indeed future concern um, among the public right now is security in Mexico, which is, of course, uh, tied to corruption. But what we have seen or, or to look like the candidate who will continue the fourth transformation or who will continue to implement any clear um, any clear message or campaigning uh, specifically on anti-corruption. The, the campaigning cycle has actually not started yet. What we're seeing, uh, it's going to start in September, parties, a party to choose who will be the candidate for Morena specifically. So what we're seeing candidates very briefly, we see um, among them that Claudia Sheinbaum and Marcelo Ebra are the preferred candidates, both by the party, the civil society, and also Andres Manuel López Obrador. It is highly likely that it will be Claudia Sheinbaum, the next president of, the, of Mexico City. She is the governor. Um, uh, we have seen various transparency challenges. Uh, transparency, like there's basically very scarce information on uh, government spending and uh, the civil society has raised these questions continuously so if Claudia Sheinbaum or Marcelo Prat are the ones uh, to hold the presidency next year already have a cor uh, corruption rec uh, track record so um, we think the the public evaluation of the of the will be undermined and in many cases politicized uh, I will leave it at that Brian Thank you very much, Lucia. Geert, there's a question here about methodology that maybe I could throw over to you. Um, two, uh, one, how well does the index capture these countries' capacity at the subnational level and the link processes? And I that may reflect some of this, um, you know, uh, what they call in some countries the war between institutional, judicial, and legislative branches. Yeah. So. I think the second one is probably your uh, pet horse. I'll let you comment on those, but at national level here. So um, obviously, uh, you know, when we look uh, at the variables, they're all indirectly informed by sub national level, but clearly uh, it's difficult to dive into, you know, regions, provinces, states. Um, and it's a, it's a valid question because when you look at the anti-corruption environment generally and enforcement, capabilities, they do vary uh, between eight, um, but it's not explicitly captured in the index. What I would say about the oversight bodies, and uh, be keen to hear your thoughts on that as well, uh, Brian, um, the democracy and political institutions, as, uh, but more in ro uh, lawmaking ruling processes, but the topic, the, uh, you know, the legislative, which we've seen many versions of across the region. And do is follow up with the specific uh, the person who asked the question with a little bit more detail about the methodology, which, by the way, we're happy to do with with anyone who's here. If you want to look under the hood and see how we do some of this, the the, the methodology is 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 something. Buddy, who was here, uh, people who joined us online, uh, as well as our partners at Control Risks for you know another very uh, is politics. Uh, so, with that, um, thank you again. Thanks for joining us, and have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.